Well, good evening, everyone. How's everyone feeling? Good, relaxed, excited. We have a little jazz music in the background. Is that the tone? Um, my name is Shawnee Holly Baptiste, and I'm so excited to serve as our moderator and facilitator this evening. So, um, I wanted to introduce, I'll say, two legends. I think that's safe to say in Chattanooga Dr. Uh, Edna Varner, here to my left, and Reverend Pierre, here to my right. So if we can, um, maybe you could each just first tell us a little bit about yourselves, and then I have a series of questions I hope to engage you both with. So I'll turn it over to Reverend Peter first. Good evening to everyone. Currently, I'll start with currently. Currently, I am president of the Chattanooga-Hamilton County branch of the NAACP. This has been a long trail to getting there. I worked for TVA for 30 years in finance, and then I worked in residential finance um, for about 14 years. I am a minister. I have pastored three churches. I really enjoy Chattanooga. I think it's wonderful. I would tell people when I travel that I'm glad to come back and walk on the tarmac. Chatt Chattanooga is small, but I think it's a very home felt type place. And believe it or not, I have been places that I've met people from Chattanooga. So I really enjoy Chattanooga. My life, I have children, and my life has been around my children, my grandchildren, and now my great-grandkids. So I think art is one thing that plays a very prominent place in our lives, and it takes us to places where we maybe will never go. But it also shows us where we can go. Thank, Thank you, Reverend Pierre. How about you, Dr. Varner? I don't think there's much left to say. <laughs> Hi, I'm Edna Varner. Um, like Reverend Pierre, I love this city. This is my happy place. I have lived here my whole life. I was born in 1949, but I believe Truman was a president. So I have grown here. I have history here. I have never really wanted to live any other place, even though I had a job for 11 years where I would travel and maybe stay somewhere for a week or so. But this is, this is my space. This is my happy space. This is where my family from, uh, my friends are from. I'm an educator. When I was in elementary school, I thought I wanted to be a teacher. I absolutely love school. I hit the teacher jackpot every single year. <laughs> so I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I thought, I can have a career where I get to stay in school. <laughs> well, I officially retired in 2001, but I'm a retiree who won't go away. <laughs> so I work with the Public Education Foundation, and I work with a program called Project Inspire. And we recruit young people who also uh, are passionate about teaching, and all the things you hear about teaching, what's wrong with it, what's wrong with education. These are folks who know that they can lead the change that they want to see in education. And one of them is here tonight, I don't feel that she's a history teacher, and she's a graduate now, and in a few months, she will be uh, teaching in Hamilton County Schools. I belong to, uh, I'm a member of the NAACP, and I serve on boards of uh, a number of boards, and I'm not to why, because I love this city, and serving on boards is my opportunity to give back, but it's also my opportunity to connect people. I'll be sitting in one meeting, and a group is talking about something they want to do. And I have an opportunity to say, well, there's another group who wants to do that too. And so why don't we connect and do it together? So I see a number of familiar faces here. I, uh, I'll end this, I won't end, but I'll end this by saying, I tell my students who 
they have more gray hair than I do. I'm still traumatized. Uh, but uh, I tell them I am old and I hope to get older. Thank you, Dr. Gardner. I think of Chattanooga. What was your fondest memory as a child or a young adult? Your fondest memory as a child or a young adult. Dr. Gardner, we'll start with you. Okay, I'll tell you a little about me. I grew up within walking distance of this museum. I was born to my family at, right down here on M.L. King, which at that time was called Ninth Street. And my whole world was from Central Avenue to Lindsay Street. Now, sometimes we would go beyond those borders, but most of my world was there. And I loved my neighborhood. There were still residences on 9th Street then. And so our house was on 9th Street, and the house was across the street. If you know where Champions is, there's a pink purple looking building there. That was my uncle's restaurant, my uncle Pete. My aunt married a Puerto Rican, so it was called Pete's Casa Loma, Pete's mm -hmm. House on the Hill. And that's And the block down, does anybody know where Mimos is? Mm -hmm. There is a boarded up place right next to Mimos. That was my dad's store. And so it's interesting when I am down there and see those places boarded up. Uh, my family members either worked there, my mother was a waitress in my, um, in my uncle's restaurant. I also remember that it was segregated then when we were in Chattanooga, but I, I didn't even think about that because my whole world, I loved and who cared about me, lived in those blocks. I don't remember worrying about my safety because there was always somebody sitting on the front porch watching all the kids. People knew each other, so if you went to the store and didn't have enough money, they'd just make a note in the book and you'd pay it the next time you were there. I remember uh, Miss Ray up the street, we'd go to her house because she'd always have cold rice with sugar on it. And so nobody even worried. Our, our parents knew when we were not in eyesight, we were still being taken care of. And when I think about the whole, this exhibit and really free, the only time we left 9th Street was, I remember at the beginning of the year when we went down to the leader to get our school clothes or periodically we'd go beyond Lindsay Street. And when we went beyond Lindsay Street, that's where we weren't really free because that's where the signs were that said colored and white, and there were places, you follow the lead of your parents, you can't go in here, you can go in here, you can go in the department store, uh, just look for the signs, Typically, we just looked for black people, and we knew that's where we had permission mm -hmm. to be. And so the on only time I didn't feel really free, I think, was when we went past Lindsay, because we had to for some reason. And then when we went back, we were in our little world again, where it was my happy place. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you sharing that insight about just feeling safe and feeling a sense of community uh, in your own community. Uh, Dr. Uh, Reverend Pierre, um, what was your fondest memory as a child or young adult? My fondest memories were Lincoln Park, which was a park for black people. Now there was Warner Park just across the way, but of course we could not go to Warner Park. We went to Lincoln Park, and it was exciting at that time because uh, some of the people who did good things in Chattanooga lived all along that street. And I point out to people sometimes that I live right where the parking lot is for Erlanga when you turn off of um, 3rd Street, mm -hmm. right at the corner of 3rd and Central. On the corner was Rudolph's store. And so um, Mr. Morgan 
was the one who worked at Rudolph's store, and he lived in the next duplex to us. And I was thinking, I said, well, there was Rudolph's store, the culottes stand, because we had to have culottes. <laughs> or there, nickel, I think. Yes. And there was the uh, Miss Jones's house, and then Mr. Bowden's house, Miss Porter, and then our house. And then um, there were other neighbors, and like I say, Mr. Morgan lived in the house uh, next to us. And so as you went down the street, you found different places to live down, people that lived down the street. Uh, Irvin Overton lived next door to the other little restaurant on the corner. And before you got to the restaurant, it was actually Wheel Street that went up the hill and it did end. Well, there was a two lot stand on that corner. <laughs> <laughs> and then as you went on down the street, the Wasa Terrell, Tom Etta Hosley, and all these people lived down there. So those were all our friends. Mm -hmm. And so we would all meet up in Lincoln Park. And then we had people who came from the south side, who came from the west side, and some people from um, what is now Washington Hills, mm -hmm. that area. They would all meet up in Lincoln Park. Well, we went in the summer, and when it was good weather, we went to Lincoln Park almost every day. We met everyone that had baseball, uh, we played uh, volleyball, uh, we played ping pong. There was actually a city center in, recreation center in Lincoln Park. And so we went in there, we played, we had a good time. Uh, Lincoln Park also had an Olympic sized swimming pool. And we had animals too. We had Mary the Bear, and we had six monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> and they were over on the side by the pink apartments on the side. And some very smart young people came out of those um, pink apartments. And I can remember one family in particular with the Normans. And I don't know what their mother said then because they were all smart. Arthur <laughs> <laughs> was actually in my class. But there were so many of them, they had somebody in every place, mm -hmm. okay? And I think at that time, Dewatha Chira was my best friend at that time on uh, Central Avenue. And this is just the part between 3rd Street and Wheel Street. And then there was another um, restaurant there, right in the sort of diagonal place. There's a doctor's office there. There was another restaurant there. And so everybody looked out for us. Mm -hmm. I don't care who, who it was. And they'd say, you little girls need to go home. It's getting dark. <laughs> so we just, I enjoyed that. Uh, after school, we would go to Phil Arts Drugstore, which was on Central Avenue, and we'd get cherry smashes. And they were good. But we had to stand <laughs> at the end of the counter. We could not sit down. Mm -hmm. But we didn't care, we just wanted the cherry smash. For those who may not know, what's a cherry smash? It's ice and it has a lot of cherry in it. They had thick cherry. And then they would stir it up and put a little ginger ale in it. No. I want a cherry smash. <laughs> when you all have discussed your childhood, you both speak so fondly of not just the physical space of community, but the people, the teachers, you know, the street names and the intersection. We're all going out for cherry smashes after this uh, chat tonight. Um, thinking through your fondest childhood memories, what do you see as some of the biggest hurdles and challenges for youth today? Well, um, when I was growing up, things just seemed so simple. Mm -hmm. For example, when we were in school, I told you I hit the teacher jackpot <laughs> every single year. And uh, school was a place of wonder. Uh, I remember we had, uh, when I was in elementary school, I first developed my love of music. Mm. And I was in the flutophone ukulele band, and I remember my parents spent $5, and I could choose, I chose the ukulele. And I was in the flutophone ukulele band, I was in the choir, 
I was in the yearly play. I was the princess who couldn't cry, <laughs> I guess because I could just learn lines really well. And so, and I think about school now and all the things kids don't have in school. The very things that made it a place of wonder for us have been cut out. You don't have art classes and you didn't have to really be able to draw well. My brother could. And I just thought, we're in the same family. We have the same parents. So if he can draw, I should be able to draw. Not true. <laughs> uh, but I can do other things. Yes. <laughs> Uh, but I just remember school being so great and our teachers, I wanted to be a teacher because our teachers came to school every day looking like they work for Fortune yeah. 500 mm. companies. I mean, now you go to school and kids are, teachers are in blue jeans, you don't know which <laughs> ones are the teenagers and which ones are the kids, but they always look so professional. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I wanted to be like them. And I would uh, keep note about them. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I started being a person who would speak out in elementary school. Uh, I had this teacher. I, everything wasn't wonderful. <laughs> but uh, he would line us up. And the first person by the door was the best reader. Mm -hmm. And then the worst reader was up there by the window. So I was so full of myself. I was the second person. And so I met with him after school to explain <laughs> to him that I thought I was really the best reader. <laughs> and he said, I make those decisions. And so every time he'd do round robin reading, he would start with that girl. I, <laughs> to this day, I, I try not to blame her because it wasn't her fault. I, I think she got chosen for the first seat because every day her ribbons matched her socks. And I was poor. <laughs> so anyway, she would start reading, and every time she missed a word, I'd go. <laughs> <laughs> he never moved me to the first seat, so I, I remain uh, the second best reader in uh, the fourth grade. But just middle school and high school, they were so wonderful. And when you talk about hurdle, now in school, there's not that, I don't, see the love of it that I used to see. And when they talk about the truancy and all the horrible things we're gonna to do to kids for being absent, my first thought is, why don't you make school fun? Mm -hmm. And kids will come to school. A lot of the arts are gone, and I don't remember the pressure on testing, but I think we were pretty smart. We did, a, did okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then the big thing, you know, the law that we've got to integrate school. And I went through all of the different iterations of trying to integrate schools when I thought, you know, we're just fine. Hmm. Just let us have uh, the same resources other people get. But uh, they tried to, I was in one school where they decided that uh, since we were a small school, first of all, I was in a small school, about 200 students, about 100 white and 100 black. Come on, that's perfect. So the enrollment was down. They sent me to another school. That's what they do. They sent me to another school. I was, about, I was there about three weeks. And then they said, the enrollment is up at your original school, so you're going back, which I was happy because I love that school. It was my first school. Over Christmas break, they closed our school, wow. sent all the white kids to one school, to Northside. No, they sent all the white kids to Alton Park. They sent the black kids to Northside. Over Christmas break, can you imagine mm -hmm. that? And these kids had grown up together, but it was their attempt at integration. And then, not blaming anybody, when we got to our new school, they didn't want to disrupt their whole schedule. Mm -hmm. So they kept us all together. And one kid asked me one day, if we were all going to stay together, why did they make us come over here? Mm -hmm. We could have just stayed where we were. So that was one attempt. There were many. Then somebody got the bright idea that if we can't integrate the children, let's integrate the teachers. And so there was a mass transfer of teachers. This is about 1985. 
And so every school had to have 60% white teachers mm -hmm. and 40% black, because that was about the population. So they just disrupted schools all over the city to finally satisfy one of the longest lawsuits in uh, the nation's history, the James mm -hmm. Mapp lawsuit, 26 years mm -hmm. trying tinkering with integration. Mm -hmm. And so we all had to endure that. And a lot of it played out in this place that I had always loved, school. Mm -hmm. A lot of it played out there. And that, you know, that really was a travesty. And what was even more, after all that and the transferring of people and the moving of few kids so that we could be diverse, in no time we were back to where we were before, mm -hmm. segregated. As soon as the law got satisfied, then people didn't have to work at it as hard. So it, it, for me, it, it, it had an impact because I loved school mm -hmm. so much and all of this was happening in school. I'll tell you one other thing. I, when I was growing up, they, uh, you know, I told you when we went past Central and went downtown, they had the signs of white, colored, and so forth, and there were places you couldn't go. So they started taking the signs down. I remember going into Cressus, where they had black bathroom, white bathroom, mm -hmm. and you know that was during separate but equal. So I thought, well, I'm going to go to the white bathroom because I can. I went in there, and I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> this is not equal. Hmm. Ray Charles can tell you this isn't equal. <laughs> Why did you do that? But you know, I've, I've thought about it since. And there are people, I, I am convinced that there are white people who would have, if they had known that, they would have done something about it. So it's not black against white. Uh, I do history lessons with uh, kids now. At, and I intentionally showed them the photos of blacks and whites mm -hmm. together working toward equity. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was just surreal. I am happy, though, that I lived through that. So when I tell my kids about it, I can tell them how I felt. You know, you read history, and you can tell what's there, but you can't really tell how it felt. I can tell you mm -hmm. how that felt. I can tell you how it felt when I read in the paper that at the, the theater that was on, um, it was on Market Street, and the paper said, we're going to let a few black people in and Rogers. see how it goes. The Rogers. Mm -hmm. We're going to see how it goes. And mm -hmm. if there's not a problem, we'll let a few more in. And I thought, what do they think we're going to do? Mm -hmm. We just wanted to watch the movie. That's mm -hmm. it. Uh, but it, it was just interesting to go through that as we gradually uh, started integrating Chattanooga. I appreciate you sharing that, Dr. Varner, about what was happening on a national political landscape, but actually how that felt in your body, how it felt in your family, how it felt to be shifted for your school. I can't imagine going home for Christmas break and then coming back to a completely new school with new students, new teachers, new administrators, just in a completely new environment and not always feeling welcomed. Yeah. Um, and the urgency after, mm -hmm. I mean, the law was passed in what, 54? And this was Brown versus the Board of Education, mm -hmm. first time in 54. And this was in 1972. And I'm like, what's so urgent now that we've got to close two schools mm -hmm. and shift kids over Christmas break? You can't wait till the, can't wait till the end of the year. You've waited since 1954. Mm -hmm. Decades have passed. Right. What about you, Reverend Pierre? What are, what do you think are some challenges that young people face today? I'm glad I'm not a young person mm -hmm. at this point in time. I really am, because I think they have missed the joy and the beauty of being a child mm. and having someone there to take care of you. The, I think society has lost the understanding that we're the keepers of the children. Mm -hmm. If we were not the keepers, then the children would go to work, pay the house note, buy the cars, and do those different things. I think part of the problem has arose because of how products are merchandised 
And so children see all of these things on TV, in the movies, uh, online. They see all these different things, yet they cannot reach mm. and purchase what they see. So they found other ways to get those items because they think those items will make them feel better and they will be accepted. So with that said, I think they have lost a sense of who they are. And that's one thing I've always tried to instill in my children, my grandchildren, and my great-grandchildren. One of my uh, grandchildren, uh, I don't know whether you've been around or you've done it yourself, they get together at different times, mm -hmm. and they tell stories about me. And <laughs> <laughs> they say, um, well, she didn't ask if you want to go to college. She says, which college are you applying? So if you, we need like being able to deal with other people. I see so many things that adults have created that is causing children problems. I mean, kids don't bring boats with, just being honest, kids do not bring boats with drugs into this country. They don't make liquor. They don't make guns. But they're being killed by drugs, mm -hmm. they're being killed by liquor, they're being killed by guns. And so they're out there trying to figure out what they need to do. I mean, it's like, whew, what do I do? Recently, I was in a community training for the police, and there was the dog that brought the police dog mm -hmm. in. And he was there chewing on this rubber thing, and he wasn't mm -hmm. paying us any attention. And all of a sudden, the police officer gave him a command. He jumped up and he was like, where is it? I'm ready to go. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to do that for our kids. Mm -hmm. So they will know there is something else in this world other than $300 tennis shoes. Mm -hmm. There is something else in this world besides big screen TVs. There's something else in this world besides going down on the street and seeing who you can shoot. Mm -hmm. It is just a situation where no one has ever taught them to love themselves. Mm -hmm. And the children who are taught that are in the minority. Mm -hmm. I went to NACP meeting in um, Atlantic City last year. You would have just loved these children. They were standing around discussing <laughs> and looking at each other. I said, oh, look at this. They were talking about the different things that are going on in society, where they're going to school, uh, their friends, and different things like that. Now, when I was growing up, I was an only child for my mother and my father, okay? And I had a car that I drove to school. When I was in high school, I had a car. I started driving when I was six. <laughs> I thought I was driving. <laughs> I sat in my father's mm -hmm. lap and I was driving and I was driving down the dusty roads and everything when we were in Mount Pleasant. And I was driving, I thought I was mm -hmm. driving. And my mother was saying, oh, Eddie, please, please. <laughs> uh, that child, she's going to run off the road. Later on, I figured out my daddy had his feet on mm -hmm. gas and he had the brake and he had the control, and he had his hands under the steering wheel. <laughs> so my mother was having a fit, and I was happy. You were driving. Oh, I was driving. So, but that was because my father worked two jobs, mm -hmm. and we always had a car. There were some people who didn't have a car, so we gave them rides, okay? But now the kids want a car, and if they can't get a car, because they are poor, mm. they will steal a car. Recently, you saw that in the paper, mm. and the DA is wanting to treat them as an adult. Mm. Well, I can remember when kids did go joyriding, mm. but it was a joyride. Nobody put kids in jail for joyriding. So we, we've just, somehow, we have, we're losing our children. We need to back up and understand that it is our responsibility to make sure that children stay children mm -hmm. until they become adults. 
I appreciate what you all have shared. You all have uh, discussed the nurturing that you all felt as children, but also the urgency of creating a safe space or safe spaces for children today. Um, if we were to think for just a little bit past childhood and think about the 1980s, so go back just a few years to the 1980s, uh, and when we think of much of Nellie Mae Rowe's work, a lot of her work really centers on colorful images to express changes that were happening in her own community in Atlanta in the 1980s. What was like life like for you during that time period? What were you doing in the 1980s? Well, in the 1980s, I was working at Tennessee Valley Authority. This is a time when African Americans came into the workforce, seven, 1970 and forward. And so there were quotas. You know, everybody needed to have someone so they could check the box off. And uh, at that particular time, I first, I started in 1970, but my goal was to move up. So I started in as an SB2 clerk. The lowest level mm -hmm. was the one. And I had a college degree, hmm. but the money that you were paid was more than teachers were making at that time. So um, I started working there, and by 1985, I was the financial analyst. So I spent my time going to different seminars and uh, different type training to better myself in terms of what I was accustomed to, because you have to understand, I was not accustomed to this world, or wasn't accustomed to the business world, but I was certain that um, we needed to make a change. And I can understand the art, because during that time, uh, if we remember here, they were tearing down sections of the city, putting in freeways, mm -hmm. uh, building big buildings, um, just a lot of different things that they were doing. And so the places that you were comfortable with, what you were really seeing, they were changing. Uh, the whole concept was changing. Now, I could understand at that point of time, even in 1985, that my presence in a situation uh, was um, different because I was black. Mm -hmm. I understood that, but that had nothing to do with what I could learn. They put the information out there. I got the same book that everybody else got in the class, and I was going to make sure that I understood what was in there so that I could better myself, but also to make a statement that when I came in the room, they knew I was equipped mm -hmm. to be there no matter what else was thought in terms of personal matters. So 1985 was um, really a good year. Um, I think I remember one time going to New York and I think it was, I uh, saw a play coming up town. And um, that was uh, really sort of an eye opener in terms of um, how society looks at itself. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we look at ourselves? What do we think about other people? How do they fit into our space? So I think 1985 was really a good year, sort of a crossover year. Mm -hmm. Some good and some bad. But I do think that as we go through society, things will change. And we need to be ready for the change. That'll be my next follow-up question, so I'm coming back to you. You were reading my notes, weren't you, Reverend Pierre? No. <laughs> I can't see over there. <laughs> Dr. Well, Bonner? I think of, uh, you mentioned the bold colors, and then uh, just the tagline, the radical art mm -hmm. of Nellie Mae Rowe. I, for me, that, that was a time when people were bold and, and, and radical. Uh, both in the community and in where I spent most of my life in school. If you're a teacher, you know that. But I, I remember people wanting to convene mm -hmm. members of the community. And these things we had been wishing for, people wanted to talk about how could we come together to make them happen. 
And I didn't remember that ever happening before, or at least I wasn't old enough to be a part of it. And so, uh, I, you know, I, I'm, I'll go to a meeting to hear what people are talking about, and I'll, I'll sign up for that. I also remember that it was during that time in the schools, we just, we just couldn't seem to get public school right. Mm. And so a group of private citizens bought a book. It's called the Paideia Proposal. And they wanted to plan a school that was truly diverse because we'd been tinkering with it. And if you have a school that's predominantly black and you have two white people or Hispanic people, you call that diverse, that's not diverse, or the opposite. And so they thought, what if we could have a school that is truly diverse and a school uh, where with a lot of diversity, and I mean, you, it was hard to tell whether it was a black school or a white school because there was so much diversity. And what if we made sure that this school had the advantage that some of our prestigious private schools mm -hmm. had? And so a group of citizens did a book study on the Paideia proposal mm -hmm. and went to the district and they had deep pockets and they said, give us a building and we want to start a school. Mm -hmm. And that was the same year they were doing the mass transferring of teachers. That's the only reason I decided to leave a school where I'd been for 12 years mm -hmm. and loved, because they were transferring everybody anyway. And so they opened the first magnet school, and that was radical here. And they opened the school, and the other part, radical, was going to be first come, first serve, not mm -hmm. selection. And since I was a faculty member there and on uh, the selection committee, I know for a fact that they were so intentional about creating diversity. Mm -hmm. People would come and, uh, for the interview, and, and I wanted to tell them, unless you spit on us, you're going to get in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but they were so nervous about that. And it was a grand experiment. Mm -hmm. And for a while, it remained intentional about the diversity. Then other schools opened, and then all of a sudden, they forgot the diversity part. Hmm. So the schools kept the privilege. They hmm. kept the advantage. And they kept the premises of this bold idea, but not the spirit hmm. and the intention of it to find a place that was truly diverse. Who, who here went there? Okay, Kelly went there. And <coughs> you know, it, was, it was really beautiful. Hmm. But, but over time, they just forgot how important it was to demonstrate that diversity of thought, diversity of race, any kind of diversity you could think of could actually work and students could still achieve at high levels. Mm -hmm. I do remember this, the school made national news because it was such a bold idea. And this was 1986, it was such a bold idea, it made national news. But after, you know, seven or eight years, I was in a classroom and people were lined up to get into the school that year. And this boy in my room yelled out the window, he said, get out of line, it's overrated. <laughs> <laughs> And so I thought, even the kids are beginning to realize mm. that original promise is mm. eroding. And, and that's, that's a shame. But uh, we've continued to have the conversations, and they've been bold conversations, except that we go to the meeting, and we fill out chart tablets, and we have all these great ideas. And I remember going to a meeting, uh, and one lady said, what happened to all those charts we filled out a couple of years ago? Yeah. We didn't do any of that. So you know, we got the bold ideas and the bold intentions, mm -hmm. but just didn't make it to the next step. And so that's still something we need to work on. That makes me think of what are some other radical, bold, innovative things that you all either did as young people or young professionals, even as adults, even today. What's something that you've done, whether radical in a movement, in an idea, 
that you feel like, okay, this is this is an agenda that we certainly need to push forward to support to to, to support diversity and to support equity and inclusion. Okay, run up here. <laughs> Bolder than I am, <laughs> so she'll go first. <laughs> well, <laughs> when you said that, I thought about 1960, 61, 62. My mother told me not to go downtown for the city in because. Mm. I might get hurt. Okay. So I said, yes, ma'am. We got out of school and we rode the city bus at that time. There were no school buses for city people. And so we transferred downtown. So I went downtown and I got off the bus and I went into Woolworths mm -hmm. and Crescent. Most of the children did that because we felt it was time to do something different. Mm. And I realized there are uh, some, say the class of 61, that a lot of people, but there were kids there all ages. And there were adults who were there. Then, we, then I go to college, and we continued to protest different things that were happening. I can remember uh, being in college, and uh, Wilma Rudolph was in college at that time. Mm. And um, she had some bold ideas about how to do things, not just running. She had, she had a brain. Mm -hmm. And she had ideas about doing things. And I can remember talking with some of the older girls at that time, sort of making myself move ahead. And as I started work, I can remember going for my first interview at the old uh, central office, which was on 40th Street. And there was this lady sitting there and to interview me, and she was sitting up like that, and she had a twist on the back of her head, and she said, young lady, will you teach all children the same? And I thought for a while, I knew the right answer. Yeah. I thought for a while, I said, no, all children are not the same. Yeah. Therefore, when they called me to teach, I did not go. I went into business, and really, that's where I've, I always wanted to go. I just it was something about it that intrigued me. But in working, the entire time I worked, the whole 30 years that I worked, there were very few black people in investment banking. Mm. You ask yourself why. That's where you make the money. And of course, I worked for TBA. I didn't make the millions they made, but I wasn't, you know, poor. Uh, so the whole time, I felt that what I was doing was a reflection of me as a woman and me as a black woman. Mm -hmm. That what I did was going to impact how someone else mm -hmm. was judged. And so in, in, in doing that, I think we never stop being judged for who we are. It's not a comfortable position to be in. It has never been a comfortable position for me, uh, first on what I see uh, in society. Because what happens, if I walk in a room, everybody turns and they wonder, who is that? If a white person walks in the room, if somebody knows them, they'll say, oh, hey, John, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. But they don't do the same thing for me. I understand that. So I'm bold. I walk up and say, hi, my name is Ann. You know, you're going to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not uh, the wall. I'm a person. So you talk to me, and I will talk to you. That's the only way we can make this world a better place. Mm -hmm. Because none of us will get out of this world uh, any other way than this. So we need to make the best living within this world that we can with each other and be honest mm -hmm. about it. Be honest about who we are. And I was staying on Market Street Bridge by myself if I feel that something is wrong. Mm -hmm. You can't sit and see something wrong and not do something about it. Um, 
I lived for uh, what 45 years, two doors down from James Mayo, and that didn't help the situation at all. <laughs> Because whatever popped up, and my, one of my best friends uh, worked in the NACP from forever. And so, you know, you have that influence and you have a support to tell you that you need to work so that whoever you are, you can put that forth. And then you should always try to be a better person, mm -hmm. do better than you did the day before. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can remember my father had to go to the nursing home on uh, Howland Park, and uh, he had had surgery. His iliac artery had gross on it, and so, you know, was, he said he was between a rock and a hard place, so he might as well have surgery. So when he went to uh, the life care, mm -hmm. he, they had to turn him, so they let in three days, he had a bed sore. So I went on the rampage, as people might call it. But I thought it was determined. I first uh, contacted the national uh, government, the government. Uh, I had already talked to the people at Life Care, and they just were not hearing it. So I went to the federal government. Uh, after I, I went out and I sent out a press release, <laughs> And I said, here I come. We're coming down. This is what they're doing at Life Care. I couldn't get people to join me mm -hmm. who had family in Life Care. And they were not being treated properly. So me, my daughter, and my granddaughter, and some gentleman that just decided he was going to come <laughs> along, he was walking down the street, and we went out there and protested. So... Uh, I can remember Tommy Brown saying, I didn't think I should look out the door to see what you were doing <laughs> up there. But we protested. As a result of protesting, there were people at Life Care who called me yeah. to tell me the things that they were doing that were detrimental. Yeah. So again, I write the federal government and tell them and I give them the information. They had codes that they used. So as a result, they took their funding away, so it shut them down. Do, am I sad about that? No. Mm -hmm. Because there were places for those other people to go to work. They had other places mm -hmm. to go. There's always a shortage in that field. Mm -hmm. But I shut them down, and I was happy about it. Uh, even was written up by one of the large law firms <laughs> on, on what not to do to the citizens. But... Mm -hmm. <laughs> But I will always fight for what's right. Now, don't lie to me, mm -hmm. but I will fight for what's right, you know. Right now, we're working with the softball girls, little girls, black girls. Mm -hmm. Why would we pit, as grown-ups, why would we put 30 little black girls on the street and tell them they can't play softball, softball because of adult problems? We need to wake up and stop acting like children. Mm -hmm. And do what we need to do as for as making this a better place for all of us to live. Well, I, I have to tell you this: I, you're a lot like my parents, and I learned a lot about. I, I, I didn't have to be that bold, but I did learn how to take up for myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, once my dad bought a pineapple in a store and he told me to take it back and I had the receipt because it was rotten in the middle and I took it back and I said my father would like a receipt uh, another pineapple or a refund and he said you're not going to get either and I said sir please you don't want my father to come down here I don't care if father comes down here so I went back and told my dad and my dad took me back because he wanted me to see mm -hmm. him. Now, my dad is a big guy. He just walked in there and looked at that guy through the pineapple on that, on that uh, the conveyor belt. He said, my daughter told you I wanted a refund? I want a refund. He looked at him just like that, and I looked around my dad, and I want to say, I want a refund. <laughs> 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 and he got that refund. <laughs> One time 
somebody bought something and it had bugs in it and he put it in the storage cabinet and bugs got in everything and he had me sit down and make a list of everything in the cabinet. And he took the list back and got a refund. So, you know, on a smaller scale, I think you have mm -hmm. to teach your yeah. children. Mm -hmm. I think our children are taught that. I remember I moved into my house and I called AT&T because uh, I was working from the house and I needed the internet up and they were trying to sell me something. And I said, no, I don't want that, but I want the internet. And they said they could do it in three days. Three days, I called back, they didn't have the internet. And uh, I called and I couldn't get anybody on the phone. And when I finally did, she said, well, you said cancel that. I said, I didn't mean cancel the internet, cancel that other thing you were trying to sell me. So she was giving me the runaround. I kept trying to get numbers. I couldn't. So finally, I looked in the book and found that the head office was in Atlanta. I called the number. And when the receptionist answered the phone, I said, I'd like to speak to the president of at <laughs> <laughs> She said, ma'am, what's your problem? And I, I told her, I said, I'm in Chattanooga, and I ordered this, and I need the internet. And I can't wait for you know three days, three more days. They had my internet on within 30 minutes mm. just from doing that. So I have, you know, learned that to speak up from yourself. Mm -hmm. And I, I learned it from people like that. But I also have some examples of people being bold to include me. I worked at a drugstore when I was in college. And the man who owned the drugstore wanted to hire me. And I was going to be his first black person other than... Uh, a custodian. So every August, he went to Maine. So he said, I'm hiring you, but I want you to wait until September 1st, because you're our first black person who will actually be at work. Mm -hmm. Was the one who read prescription. They, they have a college degree for it now. Back then, they gave me a list of uh, Latin things to memorize, and I was a uh, automatically a pharmacy technician. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I had to wait a month for him to come back so he could make sure I didn't have any trouble. And I didn't have any trouble. The people were really nice. And, but just the idea of being the first, and look at me, I shouldn't, I shouldn't still be the first black person. Mm -hmm. But I, I can tell you three or four things where I'm the first black person. I'm the first black woman in Chattanooga Rotary. How can that be? Mm. And it was because there was a vote. Uh, there were already black men in, but they voted for women, and the vote won by one. But when will we mm. get to a time when we're not all the first black person? I was one of the first black people, not the first, to go to U uh, University of Chattanooga. There had been about 25 before. Did you go there? Uh, you know those people who went before. So when I was a kid, I lived across from the University of Chattanooga, and I, I saw the college kids. I said, I'm going to that college when I grow up. <laughs> but it was segregated then. I didn't know it. I didn't, it didn't occur to me that all the people were white. By the time I was ready for college in 1967, it was integrated. And there had been some blacks before. Uh, the only thing I knew, because my whole world was black people. The only thing I knew about being with white people is what I saw on TV, and it was all the ugly stuff mm. you saw on TV. So I thought, oh, I'm going to the University of Chattanooga, and they're going to throw eggs at me and mm. call me the N-word. And so I was braced for all of that. They treated us like royalty. <laughs> and so when people come ask me to come and talk about mm -hmm. you know, the first days and the, of the civil rights and, and uh, UTC, I, I, you got the wrong speaker. Because, mm -hmm. because they really did, they were going out of their way. And I experienced a lot of people going out of their way to be accommodating. But accommodating is not too far from what you're talking about when you walk into the room. Because mm -hmm. when, when you feel accommodated, it's like, I don't really belong mm -hmm. here, but everybody's bending over backwards. Mm -hmm. It's like you go to somebody's house and you're a guest. They're bending over backwards to be nice to you. And that is great. But you don't want to feel as if people have to bend over backwards. Mm -hmm. They invited you there. Uh, okay, but it, 
you just never get beyond that, do you? The, the feeling of being accommodated or being different when you're just a person. That, I mean, that's what we'd like to be. That's what I would like to be mm -hmm. if people I know. Both of you have shared your radical voices that have caused <laughs> uh, movement and radical change in the city of Chattanooga. As we wrap up, before we turn it over to our poet, um, last question is, you know, the artist Nellie Mae Rowe talks about being really free and being radical. Describe the Chattanooga that you want to see. Chattanooga that I want to see is one where we're really, we feel really free because the structures mm -hmm. and the systems, and don't get me t talking about schools. I'm in schools all, when all of those really live out what we all say are our best intentions. We've made a lot of progress in schools. Like I said, I've been in them since the 50s. We've made a lot of progress. But the inequities just scream at you. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, what, why can't you all see them? They're not, they're not even hidden when you go to different schools. There was a podcast called Nice White Parents. And it was about a group of parents who insisted that the new school be built close to where the children of color lived because they wanted it hmm. to be an integrated school. And they worked really hard for it. They invested in it. They advocated in it. But when it came time to send their children, they just couldn't do it. Now, those were nice white people, and I'm going to tell you what I think about that. They didn't feel really free to see, send their children because they know something is not right. Something is not right when you wouldn't send your child to a school, but other people's children have to go there. Mm -hmm. And it's not the children. It is not the children. So I, I will feel really free when we're not segregated. And we are. We still are. But I do love the fact that this city makes a lot of effort to bring us together. And one of the things, it doesn't matter where the space is. Uh, well, it does matter where the space is. If you're at the Hunter or at the Bessie or at the park, I really like nightfall and people coming mm -hmm. together. It's, the space helps, but it's what you do with the space. And it is so nice when someone you don't even know, you just start a conversation. It doesn't matter what race they are. You just start a conversation, and in that moment, you're people. Mm -hmm. But to be accommodated, it's, thank you. But uh, that's not maximal. Uh, to be tolerated doesn't feel very good. To be segregated does not feel very good. And now in 2023, just to be hated, the mm -hmm. hate, the divisiveness, the banning. I'll just say one thing. I, Rem Pierre knows I'm, I'm on my horse about the third grade retention. That history that we don't want anybody to read, there was a time when you were punished if you were black and learned to read. You were punished mm -hmm. if you were white and taught somebody to read. And now we want to punish you because you won't read. Mm -hmm. Hello, think about that. We, we, we just seem to be going backwards. We complained about Nazis and other dictators and burning books. And, and here we are in Chattanooga, mm. our space, doing some of the same things. It is mind boggling that we allow it. I school the place I love. I never worried that somebody was going to come in and shoot people. Mm. Never. And now you have to worry if your children are going to come home 
from school and it's close. Mm -hmm. It's not in some foreign country. It's right here in our state. But yet we believe everybody ought to have a gun. But, okay, all right, everybody does have a gun and now we have to feel afraid to go to the grocery store. When I was growing up, I was like, if you didn't want to get shot, don't go to a club late at night. I thought, I can handle that. I'm not going to a club <laughs> late at night. But now, if you don't want to get shot, don't go to the grocery store, don't go to church, or don't go to school. Come on. It's, a, it's hard to feel really mm. free when we're just going backwards. Our world is broken. Fortunately, our community isn't. But if our world keeps being broken, it's going to reach us. And we've got to do something about that. I'll stop. Reverend Pierre? The future. Mm -hmm. Well, let's start with Miss Nellie. As I was walking in, I saw the picture of her standing there on her uh, front yard. Mm -hmm. And I can remember going to um, ladies' houses, and they would have the flowers in the yard and the different uh, buckets hanging. And they would be like buckets, big buckets that you would get food in, and they would paint them and everything. And they would put their flowers in it, and you know, you didn't mess with the flowers. Mm -hmm. And it, you felt really good about it. They didn't go to the store to buy the buckets. They made them. Mm -hmm. And they made them in the beauty that they wanted to see. So I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about my grandmother, and they had, I, we always had flowers, and everybody just felt comfortable with it. But now, if you put something on your um, porch and you didn't get it from the store, the city comes by and tells you to take it down mm -hmm. because it's not uh, within code. Okay? So we're just in every way trying to squeeze out the beauty, the love, the art. And I can remember I'm a Truman, uh, Harry S. Truman, Dwight, David, Eisenhower baby. Mm -hmm. When you come along in that particular time, uh, when you had uh, people trying to do good things for you. And uh, right now, uh, I'm a, uh, a Trump citizen, uh, a Biden citizen, uh, different type people with different ideas, but the ideas are not cohesive ideas mm -hmm. to push us forward. Because if we're talking about a nation. We can't live in Chattanooga and be free and know what, love each other and do great things if the nation is not doing that. We're, and to this point, we are really global. I can remember the first uh, seminar I went to in finance uh, for the AMA in uh, New York. The first one I went to where people from other countries came and they had a big line set up and they had the Japanese there and they had headphones on so they could hear uh, the training mm -hmm. in their language. Well, now they have pretty much uh, a financial system that's like our Wall Street, our stock exchange. And then other people came together. That's not bad, but we seem to come together on things to make money but not come together on things that uh, push love for mm -hmm. to the community. And that's what I would like to see. I would like to see if, if somebody, if you want to be friends with somebody, you be friends with them. And they shouldn't feel as if they are uh, pushed aside or their other friends won't like them because they have different friends. We should just be free. If I don't want to talk to a person of German descent, then I shouldn't have to, but I should love them. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't do anything to hurt them. So I would see a future where people would come together, would continue to work and come together so that they would show love for them. If you show love for them within the adults, the children will follow because the children are just doing what they see the adults doing. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the adults have the, uh, the authority to say, these children are just out of hand. Are they your children? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we need 
to make sure. Uh, I've got a little great grandbaby, and they go to church and they want to put their feet up on the seat. No, no, mm -hmm. you don't put your feet on the seat. Your feet belong on the floor. Now they belong down. If you can't reach the floor, <laughs> then your feet belong down. And I insist upon that. I insist upon that. And I had my uh, one I've got, she's just like me. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord, that child. <laughs> yeah, I did her DNA. She has more DNA <laughs> than any of the rest, okay? You all wait for this one. <laughs> so she was in the back seat, and a friend of mine was in the front seat. And I said, I'm going to stop at the store and pick something up. So my friend said, oh, we'll just sit in the car. I said, okay. I came back, she had taken her shoe off and thrown it at my friend. Okay? So we said, uh, uh, why did you do that? And uh, she just looked at me. So the friend said, I told her not to play with the shade on the window. So she played with the shade. I said, okay, we'll be home in a few minutes. <laughs> so I wouldn't go home. Yeah. <laughs> Just keep moving. <laughs> well, you might remember, you might remember her to talk about my grandkids. Well, I co-raised her, mm. her daddy, because his mother died when he was in middle school. So I brought her to her daddy. I opened the door and I told him what she did, and he said, mm. she went in. And then she had to apologize after she had taken her nap. Mm -hmm. She had to apologize for what she did. I'd like to see a future where we put that kind of understanding because we need to teach our mm -hmm. children and teach ourselves in some situation that you need to respect everybody. Mm -hmm. You don't have the right to shoot somebody because you don't like what color tennis shoes they're wearing mm -hmm. or you don't like the fact that they might have one uh, leg of their pants rolled up and the other one down. That's not allowed. And if we do that and work with everybody and really show the love, and you know I'm a minister, uh, show the love that we that was demonstrated to us by Jesus, we, we, hey, we wouldn't have any problems. We would not have any problems. We wouldn't have to, you know, shoot each other, stab each other, uh, we're upset because we have a, a mental problem, so we go to the school and we just kill the children and the people that work in there. Uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't need to do that because we have a model of how we should do and how we should act. Now they say that um, if you spank your children, okay, then DCS will come and get them. Well, I think that I do better if I did spank them. Because if your kids go to DCS, they sleep on the floor in the office building. Trust me. Uh, that's what's going on now. And uh, people want to cover that. You know, the, the, all the laws give 18 year, 18 year old a gun. And when we know that you're not halfway mature until you get 25, well, your brain will change. So adults need to step up and do what they need to do to make this world a better place. We can't set the same example for the young people. And if we don't do something, then you know, you're gonna be taken over by ill will. So everybody gonna stay in the house and get a gun and nobody can come to your door. So we need to really love each other, take care of each other. That's the future I would like to see. I like to see us be like Miss Nelly, where she uh, developed all of those pretty things, mm -hmm. and nobody comes to tell you you're against the code, or you can't uh, put your blanket on this side, or you must cut your grass so that it's no more than a half inch high. All of these rules that we have about things that make no sense whatsoever about people. So I just I would love everybody. <laughs>
Let me wrap up real quick and we're gonna have our art artist and then a Q&A. So first of all, I wanna thank Dr. Varner and Reverend Pierre for sharing your words of wisdom, for providing a call to action for all of us to ensure that we're keeping the human being experience at the center of what we do, that we hold each other accountable, and that at the end of the day that we just continue to love on one another. So thank you both. I wanna turn it over to somebody I love, Ms. Erica Roberts to share some final thoughts. Erica Roberts, um, local poet. So kind of what I did was um, took poetic notes, kind of in a way, um, and wrote a little bit um, to talk through. This poem is entitled Moon Pies and Memories. Moon pies in Rock City, bottle caps and pop rocks, candy ladies and freezies, cool lots and cool times. Smoky sunsets in the evening, the old plantation has duality, past and presence. Since the place, since this place, giving grace. Mimos, their history, take note. A stroll down memory's lane takes us through rough areas that often open to smoother moments, passing roads not traveled, ignored or overlooked, accommodated and tolerated, opportunity often gated, color prisons, catching dreams, a cacophony of sound signaling what was delayed, tradition ringing, maraschino colored chimes, all for a reason. The art sees it all and stands as a testimony to the lack and the possibility of it all. Panels of wisdom guiding us even now, vintage at vantage points, vibrant vision, seeing what we missed, my history lives here. No worries within the boundaries, freedom was invisible on the other side, an education of happiness dwells within this valley. Gathering together, even though separate, safely watched, sweetness intertwined with ice as treat meet smiles as cherries meet the ice. Protest, propelled, providing peeks into what's possible. There's no glossing of the issues. There's an urgency of love, the energy missed, empty spacing, joy strategically rubbed out by erasers of the lost, even though the evidence left on paper is still gone, but seen. Identity has value. The elders stand as abbots, breadcrumbing from the past. Times change, yet the art radically lasts. Excuses are plenty. The privilege made us at times envious. But we must stand guard, preventing the gentrifying of our undeniable genius. The future of freedom is still being focused, tuned, zoomed in on, pointed to, and hoped for. Just a few moments, if there are any questions, for Reverend Pierre and Dr. Garner? I, I see efforts like the work that the hunter is doing. The hunter is so established in our community. If it did nothing different, we would, we would like it. It's a happy place. But I think the hunter is making sure that black artists mm -hmm. are included in the collections, that uh, there are exhibits and opportunities like this for us to come together. I agree with Reverend Pierre. Now we've got to take it to the next level. But there are a number of places that are, and, and that's one of the things I love about Chattanooga, that um, we are trying to create the spaces and we feel comfortable in the spaces now let's do something radical. Mm -hmm. Let's act out our intentions and rally the people we know to act out our intentions to make sure we buffer ourselves from this nonsense. Maybe we educate ourselves, but I don't know what we do with this nonsense that's going on beyond our community, uh, but let's not be tainted by it. So I love radical. 
Uh, that's what I loved the first time I heard about this uh, exhibit, and I first looked at it on the internet, and I thought somebody mm -hmm. who doesn't care what other people say, this is me, this is my art, take it or leave mm -hmm. it, but this is what I'm going to be. You can label it if you want to, but it doesn't affect me. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yes, go ahead. Yes, um, so I, I wanted to ask because of your incredible influence in the education in the county with everything that's happened in the shooting that happened earlier this week, there was a violent threat at Sail Creek earlier this week as well. And I believe today there was another violent threat at another Yancey County school. I don't remember exactly I think it was Disney, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but based on your experience in seeing that grow from the violent activity from our youth, um, what is your, do you, do you have any sort of, I guess, gauge or pulse of where this is coming from in our kids? Mm -hmm. And if that has anything to do with just generational changes that haven't been adapted to, you guys were mentioning, um, or if there's maybe something else. But yeah, I apologize for having this real question. Mm -hmm. This is on the, on the time. I don't know what to do about it, but I can think of a reason for it. When we were younger, we didn't, there was craziness going on all around us, but we didn't have ready access to mm -hmm. it. And I think now we have ready access mm -hmm. to the craziness and children, what I see them doing, they, they don't know what to do. It's a combination of frustration and depression. And it used to be like both of us talked about, your whole neighborhood would embrace you. Somebody in your neighborhood uh, sitting on the porch would say, come over here, honey, mm -hmm. what's going on? Let me talk to you, take you inside, give you a biscuit with some jelly on it. The adults are so out of whack mm -hmm. that there's nowhere for the children to get that direction that used to be so available. They are desperately trying to figure out life and navigate it. And they, they don't have enough adults who are not going crazy. And so that means all of us, we're, we're going to have to step up, but there's just, I don't know, sometimes I go home, I don't want any mm -hmm. media on. <laughs> I just want to be in the house by myself. I will put Percy Slid's <laughs> a, little, a little music. But it's because if you turn the radio on and get on the internet, you got to hear about people killing each other and all of this. And, it, and the kids... I'm mature enough to know that I can block it out. They, I don't think they know what to do. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, I, I don't think children know exactly what to do, but it is the adult's responsibility. I'd like to see Miss Nellie's front porch come back. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Absolutely. I'd like to see and Ms. send Nelly's the children in her yard. Miss front porch come back. They're uh, <clears throat> older people who are afraid to sit on their front porch mm -hmm. because of gun violence and robbery and uh, different mm -hmm. things. But all of it comes from our society and what we think about the dollar. And the dollar being the most important thing that's out there. And so we try every way we can to get that dollar. If you don't have it, you want it. If it's been taking it from somebody, you take it from somebody. The thing that bothers me most about it, it is not a black issue. It's a society issue. You have bad parents, I don't care what color they are. They don't take care of their children. You have children coming to school and the school is now feeding the children. They must feed them breakfast and they feed them lunch. And then on the weekend, they give them a pack of food to take home so they won't starve before they get back to school to eat. That's a breakdown in society. And so you're forcing uh, the education arm to be the mother and father of your children 
and to provide the resources that the parents should provide for the child. And I know the poor is always going to be with us, but we used to take care of the poor. If I ate, you ate. You know, nobody on the street went without food. So, uh, you know, I can even go back to the days when people would kill hogs. Uh, some of you are too young to know about it. And maybe you have been in the country, but they kill <laughs> hogs. And so the families would come and they would give them different parts of the meat. And then we would put it in the smokehouse and it would smoke and would hang up there. And then when we wanted ham or whatever, we'd go out and my grandmother would go out and slice it off. And if the skippers happened to get on it, then she'd put in some hot water and kill them. And then we that would be the food for us. But she would share with people in the neighborhood who didn't have the food to eat. So I think it has to do with the parents and our family. Um, like, you know, everybody comes to my house if they sick, <laughs> they come to me to take care of them. If they little, they come to me to take care of them. They know I love them, but we do have rules. And so we need to take that on. Like, uh, I can remember there were very few people in the old folks' home, what they used to call it. But now, that's the place you see your folks. Because that's how society has forced us to live. So to the young man, uh, if you can do something in your family to sort of support your people, and tell them, hey, let's get together and figure out what we can do with these problems. I, you know, little babies are dying of fentanyl. Mm -hmm. Because just a little tiny bit will kill you. So, you know, uh, a little two-year-old, I can remember when I first heard about fentanyl, uh, the parents had it on the coffee table. And so the little two-year-old was playing around the coffee table, and she died. So we need to make sure that we don't do those things that are causing us. And the only way we can overcome this is to talk to people about it and be upfront with them and tell them this is not the way to do it. I think we're going to just have to make the difference that we can make in the space we mm -hmm. are and demand in the space we are. We're right here in this community. Make some demands that get us closer to the civility we all deserve. Because uh, well, Pat Summit said, it is what it is right now, but it will be what we make it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've got to work on, what we're going to make happen in this community, in this space where we are. Thank you both for reminding us to do what we have uh, where we are right now. I want to thank everyone for coming out this evening and being so open to listening to so much wisdom and insight from Dr. Varner and Reverend Pierre. Let's give them a round of applause. Please.